Hey, welcome back to BatBreak.com. Nick, once again, joined with Steve Massey to my left, Dan Cleary to my right. We're going to touch on player characteristics, what exactly that means, and what attributes we look for in certain players' bats because they were so consistent uh, throughout their career and bat-to-bat -to, -bat to prep them the same way. So, guys, who do we have? Obviously, a lot of bats here in front of us, as you can see. A lot of these guys, like I mentioned, were very consistent, right, And how they prep their bats. Who do who do we want to talk about? Well, I think obviously we pick guys that were consistent because not all players are. It can be all over the place with tar, no tar, tape, no tape. So uh, I guess we'll just start over here. Um, we got Jorge Posada, uh, longtime catcher for the New York Yankees. Very consistent over his career. Uh, the um, uh, Known as a big pine tar guy. I'm a big Posada collector. I've owned many, many Posada bats over the years. The pine tar, as with a lot of these guys, got heavier as the years in their career went on. Mm -hmm. um, I have two late career Posada bats here that are pretty filthy. filthy. Um, no batting gloves, right? No batting. He was, a, I think there's somebody around now who doesn't use batting gloves, but not many guys. Uh, a lot of catchers don't. Catchers yeah. like to yeah, get their, their hands they, There you go. Yep. So the thing with, uh, with Posada bats is he was always really consistent about this crisscross tape Pattern, which sometimes can be hard to see because it gets covered with pine tar. Like the next you do this, yeah. you know, six or eight inches of crisscross tape up here, and then he would apply a heavy amount of tar to right around the brand. And what he would do is, he, and you, if you could actually feel that, that tar is not one hundred percent dry. Right, still, and, and, and that year is, that? is what two thousand eleven, two thousand ten. It's not. It doesn't say. I don't think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Prior, so then probably two thousand eight. Eight. Uh, he still. would he would grab the tar. And then come down here, and it would transfer. So, mm -hmm. like on this bat, you can't even see that there's tape on the on the handle. Were his helmets a mess too? Did he touch the helmet? Yeah, he oh, said. Yeah, yeah. there's some helmets that were pretty messy over the years. Um, you can also sometimes see the dirty some, jersey on the well, back. Well, actually, what you'll see is uh, there's a set of uh, catcher's equipment that's out in the hobby, and his his right shin guard down by the oh, foot is covered in pine tar, and that's the hand he throws with. Sure, so, sure. Anyway. Uh, uh, they all have their moves. Of right, course. Yeah. So, typical late career Posada bat here. Tons of tar. Um, also, he loved both of these bats. Big, big cleat tapper. Usually always on the front. Even though he's a switch hitter, you usually find the, the cleat marks on the front for him. Um, so, really, did, never really, aside from the first couple years of his career, never wrote his number on the knob. Uh, you'll find, you know, bats from 96, 97, and that's about the end of you seeing him, but always really consistent with the crisscross tape. Occasionally it would be spiral tape. You'll see those um, heavy pine tar on the, on the, uh, the center brand. And then uh, a pretty peppered barrel with cleat marks and ball marks on both sides because of a switch hitter. So he's... I mean, that looks like it's just going to fall right off that tar. These that's are... Yeah, that's I, why I'm really... Like his bats have just fantastic eye appeal. Yep. So Some of the best out there. And uh, he, he uh, would predominantly Louisville slugger um, in the in sort of in the early 2000s. Um, he was swinging black ones for a few years, but uh, almost always Louisville. There's some very early Rawlings bats, and occasionally there were some Maruchis later on. But, uh, they're just, they're great looking bats. He typically swung them until they broke, or would you yeah, find you know, uncracked? Finding uncracked Posadas, not easy. Big barrel, skinny handle. Yeah. So, and obviously you could see that he wasn't a one and done kind of guy. Like he mm -hmm. used them until they went. Uh, so most of the time, you'll find him with a with a handle crack. That's, right. that's the norm. And just, I mean, obviously fantastic looking bats. Beautiful. Not a Hall of Famer, but Yankee Dynasty guy. Yankee, oh, Yankee for, yeah, yeah. the eye appeal. 100%. They're always going to be in high demand. I mean, it, it carries the Yankee premium. Right. You know, like it or not. Um, yeah, the people, that, again, they, they just look great. People like him. He's well-loved amongst Yankee fans. Right. So, Great bat. And if you want to continue on, I mean, as far as speaking about pine tar. Sure. Well, you can't speak about to... pine tar without talking about George Brett. Mm -hmm. uh, another guy who was very fairly consistent. It sort of changed. The pine tar got heavier later in the career. The 70s uh, Brett era bats and even the early 80s bats, little tar, not much. Mm -hmm. um, and, and thus don't, don't have quite the same premium. Um, here we have two late 80s bats. Uh, and this is kind of what you would expect. Not unlike Posada. Apply the tar to the to the uh, 
around the center brand and then grab here, it would transfer down to the handle. Brett was not a tape guy, didn't use tape. Um, you know, really consistent hitting area on the barrel. And Brett was almost always marked his knobs mm -hmm. uh, one of three ways. He would either mark the number five, he would mark GB with the number five under it, or in the case of both of these bats, uh, it would say Lou, which was a uh, childhood nickname for uh, for George Brett. And even his later bats in the 90s were branded on the barrel George Lou Brett. That's um, cool. You know. And he would actually put tar on the knob sometimes, right? That, I find, in, in, from what I found, when you get into the 90s, start. they get super, like, this is heavy tar. Mm -hmm. I find bats that get into the 90s are just caked, like ridiculous heavy all over the knob. I've seen some great ones where you can't even see them. You can barely see the number on the knob. Right. It, was, it was just everywhere. Black. So, Barrel. Yeah. So, you know, Brett Bats, again, uh, they carry a huge premium because of the eye. Well, he's George Brett, first of all. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. Um, but uh, And he's just so famous for a pine tar. Well, incident, for pine tar. Right? He's the, he's you know, the guy. On, it, yeah. Which is why some of those great 70s Brett Bats that are super hard to find don't you know, they don't right. carry a premium because they, they don't have a lot of tar on them yet. He wasn't, he didn't go to, he hadn't gone down that road. He's the Beatles of pine tar guys. <laughs> I would say so. I would say right. so for sure, for sure. So, uh, so those are two, two players that are uh, known as prolific pine tar uh, users and abusers. Right. And you can spot them a mile away. Oh, yeah. God, yeah, 100%. And yeah, consistent. And uh, even when buying looking, one of their bats. Even looking at like the gaps here, like how mm -hmm. these are all. Yeah. It's very consistent. Very similar with the two players. Yep. Um, aside, you know, Pasadi was was big on using the tape, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that's about the length of the pine tar rag, almost. You know, from as far as yeah. where you're putting the tar on the rag, um, and he's just going right under the label there. You know, I know a lot of a lot of the other players and the equipment managers they don't like that it's just because it just gets every it's, yeah. it gets all over the place. It's hard to get off. And, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Um, yeah, but great, great looking bats, obviously. Uh, continuing down the road, we're getting down to uh, Eddie Murray here. Now, the thing with Murray that collectors just really love are these tape rings. Eddie would line up his, his fingers and his knuckles and tape these rings fairly thick around the handle. I've seen different variations. This has four rings. I've seen five. I've seen three. But uh, And it would be his ring and middle finger he'd yeah, line up with? Yeah, it would be, I'm not sure the exact finger. Okay. could have been ring, pointer finger, uh, whatever felt good at that time. Uh, but... The ones that have these tape rings have great eye appeal. This one you can see he actually shaved down the handle, the lacquer on the handle because it must have been pretty slick. Uh, but Murray Bats uh, with the tape rings are, are in high demand. It's a really cool characteristic. He was more consistent with this later in his career. He did do it early in his career with the Orioles You don't days. find a lot of the tapering bats, but when you do, they carry a gigantic premium. Yes. And he was, he was kind of all over the place. And like Steve, like your Murray Bat here... It could have possibly had tape rings. Yeah, on it looks that like there handle. might there, there may have been at some point or another. I, one of my favorite thing about Murray Bats is his very. Oh, yeah. He had a great flair for marking the knobs, mm -hmm. um, and on uh, both of these yeah. bats have always, almost always wrote his number thirty three in the knobs of his bats. But uh, he liked to get he liked to get colorful, right. like that's yours. Right. Is, yeah, yeah, I mean, they're both highlighted. Uh, he would he would do it in one color sharpie and yep. kind of highlight around it. A lot, a lot of times it would coincide with the team colors. That was a big oh, thing. I also I also right. have one where he he wrote it in black and then he he, he oh, yeah. the whole around it is all red. Mm -hmm. So those are always really fun and that's something he obviously enjoyed doing and you know his bats have, have great character as well. Do you guys have, have any of those Gwyn bats that he would color in the logo with? I yeah. do not. Okay. The, when he would color in the Major League Baseball silhouette, so those were mm -hmm. great. And red, white, blue, I, I would love to add one to my collection. Right. Yeah, those are, Tony would apparently get bored. He'd be sitting there in the clubhouse or on road trips, and he'd color in that MLB logo, which really looked great. Uh, I had a couple of those over the years. Mm -hmm. But when you have a Murray that checks both boxes with the taperings and the highlighted 33 on the knob. Uh, that's a keeper. That's the one you're, you're looking for. Because he didn't always highlight, you know, early no, in his yeah. just the 33. Yeah, 33. Um, <clears throat> so if you can get both. Uh, it's amazing the variance and what they they sell for. What like um, what what are we talking here? On a, I mean a regular one, what three to five grand? You know, with the rings. With and, the rings, you're in the yeah that three to five grand range. Without the rings, like a high grade, super nice one. Fifteen hundred. 
15 to really? 2. Really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then what about without the highlighted knobs? It's it's uh, it's an earlier bat. It's it. an earlier it's bat. So it's, you might yeah. get a couple grand. Yeah. I mean, it depends on, of course, the use and the, the eye appeal and all that. It's amazing, stuff. the range. Yeah. Just by adding, I mean, you know, eight cents in tape. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Eight cents in tape could add, uh, you know, thousands, thousands of, of dollars. dollars. Of course. And, it, and when you see them, you you almost understand. I mean, it's a little crazy, but it really. Yeah. Um, whenever people see Murray bats, they're like, uh, "That's that's pretty cool." Yep. That, did yeah. He did that on purpose, yep. you know. Yeah. And you don't see again. You don't find a. You got to hunt to find the ones with tape. Mm -hmm. You know, but yeah. I think obviously they're out there. A lot of them are stashed away in collections. Sure, mm -hmm. those are the keepers in people's collections. Well, speaking of right. tape, we have more. Uh, Paul O'Neill bats. Is that what those are? Yeah. We have a few of those. What do we have there? Three 1999 Paul O'Neill bats. Mm -hmm. um, here's a guy who was super consistent. Like, he did this long spiral tape job. Crisscross. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Crisscross Criss -cross tape. Yeah, yeah crisscross yeah. tape job uh, within a few inches of the brand um, was a big cleat tapper. Should be tons of cleat marks in these bats. As you can see there, that one is peppered. Any uh, any dents from hitting steps from one of his classic tantrums? I have I have a uh, I have a Paul O'Neill bat, another '99 Paul O'Neill bat with what we believe are three giant uh, gouges from dugout steps. Nice, just from you know. Well, it's usually the water cooler, right? Yeah, so these that... gouges were def definitely not come from a water cooler. <laughs> right. That's the angriest player I've ever seen yeah. in my life. I think. Yeah. And if you watch him on uh, on the S Network calling games, he's the most relaxed guy ever. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He got it all out on the field. But yeah, his bats, again, great eye appeal. They carry, a, the Yankee bats carry a premium over the Reds bats. Um, but they're just, they're super cool, cool looking bats. I'm always interested why the spiral goes all the way to the label <laughs> when your hands are never up there. And Bonds does the same thing. Yeah. It must just be for them, just a visual a look. Yep. You know, I, what I always found interesting with his bats was the pine tar. I think Steve would talk about earlier how it's always the <clears> tape <throat> at the top. Is darker, like there was tar either oh, yeah. that yeah. transferred from his gloves, but very be, little. But very little. But the tar wouldn't get on the bat. And then it's going to be lighter uh, tape yep. in the middle, and then obviously where he's holding the bat. But always that top. And I remember as a kid watching Yankee games, and I know it, it stood up out to me on TV that yeah. the Chris Roth tape, high tape, and then the tar, the darker tape. And he top. also consistently swung a very large bat. That's yeah. a thirty-five inch bat. 35, 35 ounce, 35 so, inch. Yeah, yeah, big and long and heavy. And no number on the knob other yeah, than you'll the Cincinnati see, You'll see some or, Cincinnati days with a number on the knob, but not as a Yankee. It was just not a thing. And he taped his bats like that in Cincinnati for yes. a while, like later. Yeah, yeah. I, early bats you won't see, but there, there's plenty of Cincinnati bats out there that are that are taped up like that. Right. But very consistent. I mean, those are three bats from the same yeah. year, but yeah. look almost identical. Yep. yep. And... Uh, I guess when you're talking about the anger, those those spike marks. I mean, he was banging away. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> in between pitches, um, but very cool bats. Yeah. Uh, so heading over here to this row, we have a Jim Tome bat. This is a Rawlings bat from '97, uh, and Tome writes known for the padded yeah. tape. And this kind of <laughs> evolved and changed a little bit over his career. But when you're buying a Tome bat, it has to have this this padded tape job. This kind of has. It's, nice. uh, it's it's thick. It's given some protection to his bottom hand here. Um, Basically, made it a knobless bat. Yeah, it's essentially, kind of what he did. and a thicker uh, knob. I have another example that was actually even a thicker tape job, and it kind of ran in, kind of made it a seamless transition higher up the handle. With and it had a padding like a gauze or something underneath there. Um, you know, he'd hold his hand off the knob here with his his hands high above his head. Uh, Tome, you're not buying a Tome bat if it doesn't have the tape. It's just, it's, it's most likely wasn't used by him or it's a real, or unless it's an early bat. Um, but very consistent, had the number on the knob. Next guy, Reggie Jackson. Now this wasn't always the case, but this is a late career Jackson bat that has a shaved handle. So when the, when the finish is too slick and some of these guys like Reggie, it wasn't a big fan of pine tar. They would just take some sandpaper and shave off the lacquer here to make it less slick and easier to grip. Um, now, Reggie wasn't always consistent doing this. If you look at photos later in his career, he probably did it around half the time. Um, but again, kind of wanted to compare this with the Murray as, as a characteristic to possibly look for for guys, which is shaving or, or scoring a handle. I love that um, look. Which is what you see here. And again, look at, there's no tar on this on No, this he bat. wasn't a tar guy at Wasn't all. a tar guy. So mm -hmm. it was, hey, let's just grip it and rip it. and. Uh, you he, know, wore, he wore gloves though, right? He wore, wore gloves, gloves, shaved the handle, 
if, if need be. Um, another handle preparation that's, this is almost iconic, I guess, when you're talking about Ken Griffey Jr., uh, an entire generation's favorite player. And I think he, he made the crisscross tape famous. So oh, I mean, yeah. it was, 100%. you noticed it on all of his baseball cards, his posters. It, it too evolved over the years. He started as a spiral. You'd do a kind of a long winding spiral tape high up on the handle. Then he went to a longer crisscross tape job and he shortened it down to where it was just basically his hands. He obviously has larger hands than I do, um, but he had it just over the hand. So uh, again, a Griff, you're not buying a Griffey bat if it's not, um, doesn't have the crisscross tape. And he also, he might have been the first, one of the first players that had this double dip lacquer. The Smith finish. The Smith yep. finish on the bats. He thought the grains were distracting to him when he could see the grains. So he didn't want to see the grains on and his that, bat. That became extremely norm. popular. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's Black almost finish. the norm. And you could see here, which Dan will mention, this has kind a, of a cool a crossover here. Yeah, different finish. And uh, So this is a, a Ricky David Ortiz bat. Um, a lot of people know that he made his debut with the Minnesota Twins, but what people don't know, and you didn't realize this, that he was actually signed by the Mariners yeah. at 17 years old. So my guess is that when he was a Mariner in the minor leagues and doing that kind of stuff, spending time with Griffey, I think he learned this crisscross tape pattern because mm -hmm. he used this for the first two years of his career. And if you, you can see that there's a very similar Absolutely. thing going on there. Um, so you'll only find this on the first couple of years of Ortiz's Twins career. Right. And then he he moved on. He changed quite a bit. So we're talking about consistency. Ortiz kind of changed a lot over the years. Um, 2004, he started doing this, you know, small tape job, which he didn't do at all in 2003. And then he moved on to Rong's bats, where he almost never did wraps, and then jump ahead. And to, then he became known for the for the for the wraps. So yeah, the Wizards, the Wizards 2011 wraps. on, almost every single one of his bats had something on the handle, whether it was. The, uh, the tape, and then in 2013, he started using the, the lizard skin. Oh, there we go. Lizard skin. And then this is a really cool one. Um, stay there. Stay put. This was used in his uh, second to last uh, regular season game of his career. Nice. And I was at the game, so that's why this one means a lot to me. But we'll do a close-up. But the on this one, pretty, yeah. pretty great. lizard skin started doing these custom wraps for their mm. players. And... It says, you know, 10-time cool All-Star, World Series MVP, 500 home runs. That's pretty cool. 1997 debut with his name. So, I mean, this is just something you can't really pass up. But character, character that adds character to the bat, and you can just see how some guys just change, mm -hmm. change all the time. Of course. Right. When you mention uh, the consistency with these guys, a lot of it, uh, you know, can go from era to era of their career. Like when we mentioned Ortiz, obviously it changed. So... It's not like you're not going to buy an Ortiz bat because it doesn't have the, the handle taped or the crisscross mm -hmm. early in his career. And he also wasn't times. always consistent with having 34 on his knobs. Right. The so Rawlings just, did. The Rawlings almost lot. always do. Right. But the Sluggers were kind of like, it hit, seems like 50-50. Hit and miss. Yep, 50-50. Right. But the Maruchis, everyone knows, they come with the number yeah, yeah. on there. Yeah. And you want the, the lizard grip on the yep. Maruchis. Yep. Um, and continuing on, the last two we got here are, are Derek Jeter and A-Rod. Now, these guys use very similar bats. Uh, these, these black Louisville Slugger P70. Here, Steve, you want to hold that one? Sure. Um, uh, P72s, which Jeter is, is famously swung. Now, when these guys were teammates, A-Rod borrowed uh, Jeter's bats quite a bit. And when Jeter, or I'm sorry, A-Rod and Griffey were teammates, they interchanged bats quite a bit. They both swung the, the black C-271. So that's where it gets tricky when teammates were sharing bats. And they both used the similar, the Moda stick down on the lower handle, which looks pretty similar here. Now one characteristic that kind of differentiates the two are the cleat marks. Well, this A-Rod doesn't show uh, many cleat marks, but when he did bang his cleats, he would really bang it against the cleat, and the cleat would take a chunk out of the wood. Whereas you see with Jeter, you'd see a lot of these divots on here where he's banging, he'd bang his cleat, uh, or his bag against the front of his cleat. He would bang, lot, he was right? a toe tapper. He a would toe, bang yeah. the, the front of his shoes. So it's mm -hmm. that molding on the front of the yeah. cleat, uh, which isn't going to really chunk out the wood as much. It's going to leave a bit of a, a larger dent. Yeah, which you can see here. It's just these little... These little kind of nicks, which are from the, I guess, the molding, the sole of his cleats. Whereas an A-Rod might be hacking away. This particular bat doesn't have too many cleat marks, but that's 
you know, it's tricky. It's kind of some more advanced stuff where sometimes... Where you need to get into knowing the, the use character. Yeah, right. And really act. Because sometimes you'll see a Jeter bat out there on the market. And you're like, why is that so cheap? Or why is, yeah. there not, why is it not selling, garnering more attention? And you look a little closer, like, oh, you know what? That might be a bat that was used for A-Rod. Yeah. And it's something that could save you, uh, you know, some significant money if you're thinking about, you know, ponying up for a Jeter bat. Uh, so it's good to ask around, do your homework. Study, study footage, study pictures, 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 video, you know, right. study. If there's a player that you're interested in, you can't look at too many photos and video to sort of see not, not only what brand they're using, but are they a tar user? Do they use tape? Mm -hmm. None how, of the above. how do you guys feel about getting bats um, <clears throat> that a player used, but it's a different guy's bat? Does it bother you? I, it bothers me. It's not, yeah. I probably, unless it was a significant. If, yeah. Hit. If it was a photo match, is something very significant, but. I, I usually sort of avoid it. Yep. Yeah. It's just... Just uh, preference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somewhat. But it's still... It's a way of getting a, a cheaper, you know, a bat for yep. a discount, yeah. <clears throat> which there's nothing wrong with that. But it's funny. Once I think we all got into the hobby, you kind of change the way you watch games when you're watching your players. <laughs> oh. Where like You notice everything they do in oh, the yeah. batter's box. Sure. Yeah. As far as gripping the... You know, going to the helmet, to the center brand, or yep. tapping the bat. Um you notice that now when you watch games, like okay, this guy's always banging his cleats, yeah. or he's oh, yeah. got you know going grabbing sure. the tar all the time, um, or you notice the tape jobs too. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, the, what do you guys think as far as the lizard skin versus the the old athletic tape? As far as uh, eye appeal, or for me, because I, I kind of lean more towards newer bats. I mm -hmm. love the lizard skin because it just adds so much flair. Uh, and it's also easier for identifying, but that's so classic looking, you know, the tape. Right. Yeah. It's tough. Uh, for me, again, I lean towards some of the older stuff, so I don't, I don't believe I own a bat with leather skin. However, it sure does make it easier yeah. when you're trying to photo match. Mm -hmm. you know, I think it looks cool. I, know the, yeah. I think it looks great. Like, I love that custom. That's yeah. really cool. Yep. But, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, I think it makes it a lot easier if you're right. collecting the photo match yep. stuff. Like, I, I would rather have uh, any of these Posadas or Bretts than a clean bat like this with just a lizard skin. Yeah. You know, there's right. so much more character mm -hmm. right. with that right there. Um, yeah, this is, I mean, I mean that pops off at you when you see the lizard skin. Like, Trout's a guy, which yep. we don't have in front of us, but he went from the athletic yep. tape to the trout to the lizard skin. Lizard skin looks a lot cooler, a lot better. But then the athletic tape is his personal touch. I mean, course, this was yeah. done by hand. It took some time. Yep. You know, they're tearing the tape in half and thirds. These feel, this these feel more alive yeah, in a way. for sure. Know? Right. And this is just, you know, they all wrap the lizard skin the same way. Right. For the most part, they might interchange colors. But uh, this, you know, these ash bats, they... I think they took a little more pride in them sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's, that's the beauty of the bath. They... From era to era, they change. Changes. And if you yeah. have both, it's pretty neat to, to show the differences, you know, over time. So, well, thanks, guys. These were some good examples of player characteristics. Uh, again, there's certain players. Do your homework. You're going to want to simply see these certain characteristics when you're spending money on their bats or else uh, you're probably getting something that may not have been used by that specific player or may not have been used in game action. So that's it for player characteristics.